Hello and welcome again to the IBESS exam for May 2024. It's happening in just about 10 days from today. On Friday the 2nd of May in the afternoon, you will be sitting for a one hour paper for ESS, the case study paper. In this paper, you will be given the resource booklet and a number of questions to answer it's going to take you one hour of time and you'll have to extract answers from the data booklet, the resource booklet, but also use your knowledge of ESS. Then you have the weekend to prepare for the all important paper two. Paper two carries the bulk of the marks in ESS. Approximately 50% of your score in the final exam is based on this all important paper. It's divided into two sections. Section A where you have a number of short answer questions. Spaces to fill in, graphs, tables, diagrams to label, things of that sort. And then the big section. Section B where you select two questions out of four. These questions are made up of multiple parts but part C of the question is particularly important of course, this video is linked to so many others where I've given tips about how to answer Part C, Section B. Lots of cards, please click on them. Please click on the links below this video to all of my tips for IBESS exams, which go back more than a decade from today. Now, in preparing for this year's exam, we have new tools at our disposal, and I want to share some of those with you. Because 10 years ago, when I made my first videos about exam tips, AI was not as prevalent as it is today. Last year's tips, I spoke about the use of chat GPT. But this year, I want to share with you InVideo AI, which is something I've been using recently. And InVideo AI can make videos for me upon my request. Now, I don't encourage students to go make hundreds of videos at this stage. But as you are reviewing for your exam, it might be useful to ask in video AI, which is free. You can click on the links below here. There's a free version of it at least. And I asked in video AI to make a video for me on the Gaia hypothesis and on feedback loops. And I'm going to share those two videos and insert some of my own notes for you to help you with this year's exam. And then I'll put a list of suggestions at the end of this video to, for you to make your own inquiries on InVideo AI. And please feel free to share on YouTube and to share with me the responses that you get. And of course, good luck in this year's exam. Have you ever stopped and pondered, could Earth be a living, breathing entity? It's a question that challenges our traditional perspectives and propels us into the realm of the Gaia hypothesis. Created in the 1970s by a British scientist named James Lovelock, the Gaia hypothesis proposes that Earth behaves like a single, self-regulating system, akin to a living organism. It's named after Gaia, the ancient Greek goddess who personified the Earth. According to Lovelock, Earth isn't just a chunk of rock hurtling through space, it's a complex, interdependent system where life forms interact with their physical environment to maintain conditions suitable for life. This concept doesn't mean that Earth has a brain or consciousness, but rather that it possesses a form of systemic balance. Picture Earth as a gigantic ecosystem, where everything from the smallest microbe to the largest ocean contributes to the planet's overall health and stability. The Gaia hypothesis challenges the notion that life simply adapts to its environment. Instead, it suggests that life actively shapes the environment to make it more hospitable. For instance, consider the way plants produce oxygen through photosynthesis or how certain bacteria help to form clouds, influencing the Earth's climate. One of the most captivating examples of the Gaia hypothesis in action is what Lovelock called Daisy World. Imagine a hypothetical world populated only by white and black daisies. The white daisies reflect sunlight, cooling their surroundings, while the black daisies absorb sunlight, warming theirs. As the planet's temperature fluctuates, the balance between these daisies shifts to maintain a stable climate, illustrating how life can regulate its environment. The implications of the Gaia hypothesis are profound. 
By viewing Earth as a holistic, self-regulating system, we gain a fresh perspective on our role as humans. We are not just passive inhabitants on this planet, we are integral components of the Gaia system. Our actions from the carbon emissions we produce to the forests we conserve directly influence the health and well-being of our planetary organism. The Gaia hypothesis also underscores the importance of biodiversity. Each species, no matter how small, plays a role in maintaining Earth's equilibrium. As we lose species to extinction, we risk disturbing this delicate balance, potentially triggering cascading effects that could destabilize the Gaia system. While the Gaia hypothesis remains a topic of debate among scientists, it has undeniably broadened our understanding of Earth and our relationship with it. As we navigate the challenges of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss, the Gaia hypothesis serves as a powerful reminder that Earth is more than our home. It's a living system that we are an integral part of, and one that we have a responsibility to preserve for future generations. So, the next time you gaze upon a lush forest or marvel at the vastness of the ocean, remember, you're not just looking at parts of the Earth, you're witnessing the lifeblood of Gaia, the have living you ever Earth. ever pondered over how environmental systems maintain their balance? How do they adjust to changes and establish equilibrium? The answer lies in feedback mechanisms. In the sphere of environmental science, feedback mechanisms are processes that can either amplify or reduce the effects of a system's components. These mechanisms can be categorized into two types, positive and negative feedback. Let's dive into the intriguing world of negative feedback with the help of a fascinating example, the story of Daisy World. A parable crafted by scientists James Lovelock and Andrew Watson in the 1980s, Daisy World is a hypothetical planet inhabited solely by two species of daisy, black daisies and white daisies. In this world, the black daisies absorb sunlight and warm up the environment, while the white daisies reflect sunlight and cool it down. As the planet's temperature rises due to increased solar luminosity, the black daisies die off and the white ones thrive, reflecting more sunlight and cooling the planet. This is a classic example of a negative feedback loop where the system self-regulates and stabilizes against external changes. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin, positive feedback, which, unlike its counterpart, amplifies changes and destabilizes the system. A prime example of this mechanism can be found in the melting permafrost. Permafrost is a layer of frozen soil that traps enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. As the Earth's temperature rises, the permafrost melts, releasing the trapped carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This increase in greenhouse gases further warms the planet, causing more permafrost to melt, creating a vicious cycle of warming and melting, a classic example of a positive feedback loop. But what if we could manipulate these feedback mechanisms to counter global warming? One idea is to increase Earth's cloud albedo, or reflectivity, to reflect more sunlight back into space and cool the planet. This concept, known as cloud brightening, has been proposed as a form of geoengineering to reverse global warming, and it works on the principle of negative feedback. So, what have we discovered today? We've learned that environmental systems use feedback mechanisms to maintain balance. Negative feedback, like in Daisy World, helps stabilize a system by counteracting changes. Positive feedback, like the melting permafrost, amplifies changes and can lead to destabilization. And finally, we've seen how understanding these mechanisms can potentially help us combat global warming. It's a complex, interconnected world out there, and every action has a reaction. The key lies in understanding these reactions and using them to our advantage. It's more than just the survival of the fittest, it's also about the survival of the smartest.